Um, now, there can be more than one way to tell a story. Uh, different mediums can bring in new elements to an existing tale. Our stories can be told across many platforms uh, right from the start. In this panel, across platforms, we're going to meet some artists who write across multiple platforms. Now, our next guest, um, Asphyxia, is a deaf puppeteer and author. She crafted the subjects of her um, acclaimed theatre show, The Grimstones, um, from household junk and the sets as well. Um, and she tours nationally and internationally um, with these gothic characters and their really intricate sets. Asphyxia has reworked The Grimstones stories into a delightful series of children's books. Um, please make Asphyxia welcome. Thank you, everybody. I'm very excited to be here now. I've written two, two books. I'll show them to you. They're about my family of puppets. My family of puppets called the Grimstones. These are the characters. This is Martha. This is her name sign. She's the main character in the book. But in the past, when I, when I made the characters, the puppets at home in their worlds, my very first story, the way I communicated, was through a stage show. We rehearsed the show and prepared the performance, and there were a lot of issues about how we could tell the story on the stage. And it gave us a lot of opportunity, really, to tell the story through a, a very kind of surreal, some very surreal elements. For example, the puppets have their own characters in the show, but I have my own character as well. I'm one of the characters in the show, even though I'm human and I'm part of the world and my world is the human world and the puppet world is much smaller. So there's this juxtaposition that the two worlds kind of mesh together and people watch the show and it makes, they say it actually makes it more real for them rather than less real. So it was a very good opportunity for us to explore that and also to explore my character, like I have a role in the story, I'm a person in, that, in the theatre show, but also I'm the narrator to the audience. So I'm standing up and I'm telling the story. So my role kind of shifts, it merges between the two worlds in a very subtle way, I have to change between the two roles. So we toured the show for several years and in the middle of that we got a call from Alan and Unwin the, the children's book department, and somebody there had seen the show and asked if I would make a book, thought it would make a good book, The Grimstone. So I said, great, of course. I'm very excited to do that. It was a very interesting challenge for me to work out how to... Like, like which, which characters were to be the main character. In the stage show, it's really the whole family. It's kind of very ensemble, and the story is about all of the members of the family. The book, though, I needed to choose a main character. So I chose Martha. It was a hard decision. And I, I had to sort of get into her world, into her head to work out, you know, how she would very differently to what I had to on the stage. So the next thing I had to do was work out how to include all the surreal elements from the show. For example, the two sizes of world. You know, my human characters as a narrator. How to mesh all that in the book. So I had to resolve those issues but I wanted to include them in the book. But in the end, I actually decided not to because it kind of added too much complication to the story and it really wasn't benefiting the story. On the, sh on the stage, it was helpful. It made the show more interesting, more layered. But in the book, I didn't feel that it would work as well. I felt that the book kind of offered an opportunity to explore in more depth the characters. But on the stage, you can't really you can only give a suggestion of the character. You can't go into a lot of depth. So I was very excited in that way to, um, to think, get inside Martha's head, in, inside her world, and really work out what she was thinking. Also, I got to see the other characters through her eyes, through her world view and her interpretation of each of the other characters, and that was very interesting for me as well. Because even simple things like the name of each of the characters, in my mind, the, the mother is called Valvetta. But Martha, of course, calls her Mama. 
It was like, it was actually a big mental change for me. It was very difficult to write that aspect of the book. I had to call her Mama and not Velveta. So it wasn't a particularly simple translation of character from, from one world to the other. It was quite challenging. Anyway, the next step for me was to, uh, look, we've recently achieved funding to do an app of the Grimstones. And this will be an interactive story on iPad where Martha becomes like a friend of the reader. So this is an opportunity for Martha to... She, she writes her diary, but it will be more, more like a direct conversation with that one-on-one one -on -one conversation with the user. And so I needed again to choose which elements from the stage show and also which elements from the books to bring into, into the app. So, so then there may also be new elements that I need. You know, might, things that might be, weren't right for the book will be right for the app. So that's another challenge that I've got coming up. Another thing that's interesting for me is when I performed on the stage show, I like to talk afterwards and explain to the audience my process, the making of the puppets from recycled stuff, the, how the sets were made, how the worlds work, how I made everything from bits and pieces of junk. And I want to really encourage people to have a go at the same kind of thing, to look around you and make things from your own world. You know, use rubbish, recycle it into something else. And in the book, I still wanted to have some of that effect, but it was quite difficult to work out how to incorporate that. In the end, I did it through Martha, through her diary. The book is in diary form, and she's writing her diary. I, myself, I've always kept a diary, so I love that kind of form of expression. And mine's full of drawings and paintings and collage. And Martha, I, I made her, her diary similar to mine, full of bits and pieces stuck in, and to encourage people, really, to read it and think, oh, I could do this. You know, it's simple line drawings. Like, my, my diary has a lot of bits of photos stuck in and various things, just to make it a richer experience. And I, I kind of wanted to add that dimension to the story itself and sort of give inspiration to people to... To, to be creative yourself. I think um, that covers it for me. Oh, there's one more thing to say. For me, performing in the theatre, on the stage, I told the story myself through my acting, through, through the narration, and involved a lot of energy going out to the audience. But when I'm writing the book at home, I'm sort of in bed, maybe in my pyjamas, I've got the covers up and, you know... I'm not dressed or anything, and I, I kind of love that. It's really much more relaxing. It's probably my favourite way to work. I'm kind of hoping that I can go more that way, the writing, and now just wind down the stage work, hide from the public eye for a little while. But thank you very much. Asphyxia with, um, I mean, some of your work, your main audience seems to, uh, it would be children um, in the work that you do. Um, what is it about puppetry that, that kind of captivates um, a child's imagination, do you think? I think um, in Australia, in general, the perception of puppetry is as an art form for children. But really, when I learnt it overseas, in Guatemala and Italy and other places, puppetry is also for adults. So I've learnt a lot, so sort of, sort of I've had to change a lot by being in Australia. People see the show and they sh assume it's for children. But actually adults do enjoy the show as well, and I've been very careful to make it appeal to both adults and children. It's pitched at adults from children up, but really a, a lot of people who are 80 or so come to the show and they're touched, they cry, they find it very poignant and meaningful. So that form kind of allows for a very, very broad audience, children and adults. But the book, interestingly, the publishers needed a target audience, so they limited it right down to children. I, I'm kind of still waiting to see, hopefully the book will be, maybe break through and it won't be just so limited to children's. You know, I'd like it to have a broader audience. And I've kind of, I've heard very positive reports from adults as well who've read the book and been drawn into it, but I don't know if it'll be able to break through that, you know, that, that picture book kind of world. It'll be interesting to see. Um, might open up for the audience. Um, is there any burning questions out there that people would like to ask um, of our panel members? Um, oh, sorry, we've just got one over here. And then, yes, John, you can. Yes. Uh, it's evident that you guys uh, sort of 
go between the different platforms without fear. But is there any platforms that you tend to stray away from or are reluctant to indulge in? For example, you might have a blog, but you, you, you're reluctant to put it on YouTube. I think uh, there's always an element of fear when you walk on any form of, you know, on stage, you never know how the audience is going to respond. It's a very personal thing. Also, there's of course a fear of what if nobody comes. You know, mostly we've been very fortunate and we've had full theatres. But um, we went to a big theatre last year. We had two people in the front row of a 500 seat theatre and that was terrifying. It was awful. So that's that thing, it's sort of a similar thing about writing, but you can hide, you can send it out there and you don't really need to see directly who responds to it. I'm kind of saved from that pressure and I quite like hiding back in the world there. Um, I was just wondering how changing platforms has changed your audience or has it changed your audiences, the type of audience who read your work? I think with the theatre show, the audience can access it very differently than with a book. For example, with the theatre show, our show, the puppets are only this big and they can really only affect so many people in the audience. You, know, you, can't, you can't fit anybody else. In, they'll go to a town, even if it's sold out, you know, more people want to come. Unfortunately, you can't do it. There's no way then for them to access the story, whether you want them to or not. That's it. 200 people is all it fits. So that's the number of people and there's a limited number of shows you can do. Whereas, of course, with the book, it's you know, much less limited. A lot more people can access it and at different times and it's a lot more flexible in that way and bro there's a much broader market. I've got a question for Asphyxia, actually. I, I, I do apologise, this, this may be boringly technical, but I was just interested. The Grimstones on stage know that they're puppets, I assume? Do they know that they're puppets? Because you're there as a human being. That's a very good question. Actually, um, on the stage, we don't really have the opportunity to kind of go into that sort of depth on stage. Oh, I'd like to, you know, say yes, I think they do know they're puppets and they know that we're humans. And we're there, we help them sometimes to achieve things uh, you know, as puppeteers, but the puppets respond to us. So that's my understanding of it in the show, but there's no way to actually express that to the audience because it's only a one hour stage show. It's very limited time to tell a story and we have to stick with it as it's written. It's kind of up to each audience member to um, work out their own interpretation of, of the strange world and, and the relationships involved in them. And in the book, you're not... You're not in the book, like you're not represented. I, I am in the book actually. Uh, my character has become Aunt Gertrude in the book <laughs> and in the theatre show you know, I'm Gertrude, Gertrude Grimstone. I'm, I'm sort of a, an ancestor of the Grimstones family and in the past I've sort of, I've found a case in the show and I've opened up these cases, I've found cases in my attic and they belong to my family in the past and that's how I've come to interact with the puppets. But for the book I felt that was a little bit too complicated and, and not really relevant. So I've just made myself a character in the book and I'm Aunt Gertrude, Martha's aunt. And I live in the same house at the same time, in the same era as Martha. You can see, do you want to see, there's a photo of me in the book. I'm quite human. I mean, I'm not, well, you know, there's a mixture of puppets and human characters in the book and I'm interested really what the audience readers, how they interpret that information. It's very interesting to me. I'm just wondering, um, do, the, do you find that the deaf people interpret your uh, work as uh, differently to the hearing world? I, I would imagine so. In my theatre show, we have a lot of little references to deaf culture, and I think a lot of hearing audience just wouldn't catch them. But because they're not aware of those aspects of deaf culture, but I'm fairly sure deaf audience members get them and have a little chuckle and they feel a little bit like the story's about their world. And I like that about it. They're small things like the characters, to get each other's attention, will stamp on the ground. And characters, they don't actually sign, but they communicate with body language and gestures. We might um, wrap up this uh, panel. I would like, if everybody can help me, and thank very much John Richards, Asphyxia, Eliza Hull and Jackie Ryan.
This is Big Ideas from the ABC.